Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture, brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director of Cultural Engagement for the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. My guest today is Gary Brashears, who teaches systematic theology at Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon. Welcome, Gary. It's good to be here, Daryl. And uh, Gary is a, a returning guest, so he's a veteran of foreign wars when it comes to the <laughs> podcast. Uh, and today our topic is big church or little church. We're going to discuss church in general, ecclesiology in general, and in particular the tensions that sometimes exist between big churches and little churches, and hopefully have a discussion in which we are able to affirm the value of each. So that's that lays out the, um, the, uh, uh, the plan. Uh, so it's time for uh, confessions. Gary, what church, what kind of church do you attend? I, I'm a member at Grace Community Church in Gresham, Oregon. Uh, it's a Baptist background, conservative Baptist, uh, but community church. Uh, we run about 650 adults in our auditorium in three services, uh, about oh, toward 1,000 in a weekend. Uh, so we're kind of a mid-sized church, I would say. Okay, and then just to I, – I have I – have feet in two churches. Um, one is the one that I've attended ever since I was a student here, Trinity Fellowship Church in Richardson, which runs uh, probably about 250, 300 on, uh, during the week. It's a somewhat traditional church, has a touch of liturgy tied to it, uh, very historically rooted kind of church. And then, uh, and then my daughter works at Bent Tree Fellowship, which is a huge church. They probably run five, six thousand on a weekend, and uh, a classic uh, mega church, if you want to think of it that way. She writes curriculum for fifth grades and under. So my wife attends there uh, to be with the grandchildren. This explains why we're in the situation that we're in. And so I'm Elder Emeritus at the first church that I mentioned, and so I attend the first service at at Trinity, get in my car and drive the 15 minutes or so that it takes to get to Bentry so I can make the second service and make uh, lunch with my kids afterwards. So so that's, uh, that's our church situation. So we're actually describing a situation in which we are all uh, participating, if I can say it that way, um, running the scale in terms of, uh, of size of church. Well, let's let's start off by talking about uh, about mega churches. I want to start there because it's, okay. they're probably the the more controversial. But before we get there, I want to ask a basic ecclesiological question, and it goes like this: the church, a building, a people, or a presence? Okay, uh, which, which which of the above, or a combination of the above? What are we talking about when we say church? Well, I assume you're thinking biblically, not culturally. That's correct. In culture, the first definition of church is a building. Uh -huh. Biblically, it's not a building at all because there weren't church buildings in the original. They met in the temple courts initially, and then in homes. There were no church buildings until quite a bit later. So the pictures uh, of the church in Scripture is a group of people committed to Jesus Christ and His mission forming a community of the Spirit. That's what we see in Acts chapter 2. And then it carries out all the way from there. And the size, well, there were 3,000 people com converted on that first day. That was uh, a membership class, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then the, the leadership develops, so that's a piece of it. There's a team of elders that lead a church. And then there's a presence in the community, and critical of that whole thing is God present with them through the Holy Spirit and through His Word. So we're not thinking about a, a location so much, or even four walls. Mm -hmm. It's irrelevant biblically. Okay. So, uh, and, and yet, as you mentioned, culturally, most people, when they think of church, they say, well, what church do you attend? And they think of a location, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. and, and so, the other, the other cultural definition that I need to really, really speak against is that the church is a meeting that we go to. So we say things like, hey, going to church this morning, mm -hmm. by which we mean a meeting. And that isn't the, 
that a church does meet, but a church is a 24-7 type thing. Okay, so so we've got these cultural things that are going on that make people uh, think of the church. How you said that it's a community uh, that uh, where the spirit indwells. Let, let's think more about the biblical side of this. Uh, what? How should we think about the church? Well, the church primarily is a, is the followers of Jesus Christ. We see that there in Acts chapter two, kind of a foundational thing where it's a group of people who have repented, believed, been baptized, and joined together under the fellowship of the apostles, the leadership there, the community. They do sacraments together, and they extend the gospel into the community so that many people come to Christ. Now, you, that, that was a description of the early church, because since you, as you mentioned, they fellowship with the apostles. So, mm-hmm. um, so when we think of the church today, what should we be thinking about? Or, or maybe this is the way to ask the question. When people go to church or look for a church, what should they be looking for? Well, there are several things to look for. One is a church that is faithful to Jesus Christ and his teaching. Of course, many churches have abandoned that and become more culturally relevant. Uh, another thing to look for is a church that's doing mission into the community instead of just an ingrown, we do stuff together separated from the community. And a, a real factor there is this is a place where the church is going to invest in me to for my spiritual growth, my personal growth, so that I can build a community, so we can be a part of a community that's doing the gospel work of Jesus Christ or the kingdom work of Jesus Christ in my region. Okay, and when we speak of kingdom work of Jesus Christ, I realize these are all broad questions. Oh yeah. Um, uh, when we speak of kingdom work of Jesus Christ, what are we what are we talking about? The kingdom work of Jesus one is forming a community of the kingdom uh, where righteousness prevails, and a key idea of righteousness is not just that I'm a guy who follows the rules. Righteousness biblically is the idea that we have a community where all relationships, God, others, self, rest of creation, are well-ordered, where people are flourishing with dignity as God designed. That's what we're trying to develop, and then we extend that kingdom presence, living under the rule and reign and life of Jesus. That's what we're trying to extend from our community into the community around our fellowship. Okay, now let me let me. Um, I'm gonna since we've brought up kingdom work, I want to bring up an issue that that sometimes comes up in relationship to these discussions, especially since you mentioned community work. You know, some people complain about a, a social gospel, mm-hmm. and what they do is they say, you know, it's the church's job to preach the word, and then the activity that's something completely separate. Break that down for us, because sometimes I think we've created a division here that is yep. greater than, than what the Bible actually suggests. The, the problem comes with that term social gospel, which was developed a hundred years or so ago by a group of liberals who bought into the idea that we need to do good work in the community. We need to build jobs and we need to feed hungry and those kinds of things, but they divorced it from the connection with Jesus Christ. So when you think of kingdom or gospel or righteousness, biblically, the first relationship is the relationship with God. So we have to develop that. That's the evangelistic thrust. But then we have the the relationship with others. That's the community of the Spirit, technically the church. We have relationship with ourselves, growing as people equipped for every good work. But then we have for the rest of creation, and we're extending the goodness of God into the community, like Jesus in Acts 10, 38, where he went about preaching and doing good, and I think that's the same mission of the church. When we separate living the life of Jesus as a community from living the life of Jesus into the community around us, I think we've actually truncated the gospel. Yes, uh, the passage I like to bring up in this regard is Luke chapter 4, where Jesus preaches in the yep. synagogue and talks about his message and mission, that he's anointed by God, that he's called to preach the good news uh, and to bring you know, and to liberate the captives. He uses all this uh, freeing language, liberation right. language in the, in the theological sense of the term. And then the very next scene is a day in Capernaum in which he's actually carrying out the ministry that he describes. So there's a match between his word and his deed, and yes. and we see the character of his ministry being not one of word only, but actually of action that reflects and gives credibility to what it is that he's claiming to bring. Correct. 
Galatians 6.10 is the same kind of thing, doing good to everyone, especially those of the household of faith. It makes it very clear that doing good is not just in the community, but it's not exclusive to the community. And coming back to your favorite book, Luke chapter 3, when John the Baptist does his foundational call to repentance, the people ask, well, what do we mean by that? And he says, if you got two cloaks, share one with somebody else. That doing good is that sharing and doing, helping people who are in need, and not just inside the fellowship, it's in the community as well. So the community is supposed to be characterized by a kind of demonstration of God's grace and caring for people that, that, it, that actually helps to undergird the testimony of the message that's being preached. Yep. Yeah. If we speak in word only, we kind of fall prey to James's thing. We're giving good advice to people. We're not giving help to people. When we put them together, the good news of Jesus with the good life of Jesus, then it reaches into people's hearts and they join in and give praise to God. Let your good deeds so shine that people give praise to God, Jesus put it. So what do you think caused the division that, that, that we sometimes end up seeing between this emphasis on the preached word versus the kind of community activity that's supposed to reflect it? I think the historically, again, about a century ago with the Rauschenbusch and his followers, who divorced the social work from the gospel work. And so what was very true in, say, in the Civil Rights Movement, uh, well, the fr Freedom of Slavery Movement back in the Civil War era, it was led by Christians who saw people being mistreated and spoke powerfully for their freedom. But in the early 1900s, they dropped Jesus from the equation and just did good works and it was the classic liberalism, the kingdom is in your heart, and they didn't see the need to do evangelism, getting people into contact with Jesus. And then the fundamentalist reaction was to be reactive, and no, we will stand for evangelism, and then they lost the doing good. We need to bring them back together, I think. Okay, so uh, one final question kind of ro walking down this road, and, and that's, it's this. There are a lot of things that go on in the culture at large that, that in which many part people participate within the culture that are good. They, 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 uh, minister, they do minister to people. They produce some forms of flourishing and care and compassion. How should the church view those kinds of activities? And what I have in mind here are there are all kinds of, of civic organizations and that kind of thing that exist to, to help people in one way or another. And, and sometimes you could say, well, we can do our own thing and, and reinvent the wheel to a certain extent and do this right. over here ourselves, or we can join in and in the midst of that not only show the church's presence, but actually rub shoulders and engage with people from other backgrounds and maybe even expose them to the gospel in the process. How do, how do you fall out on, on those kinds of, of concerns and that kind of mix? Yeah, I think it's absolutely essential to join in with the community and do it in the name of Jesus. Uh, I'm here in Portland, and we have what we call City Serve, and the churches of Portland are joining together to assist state agencies. Department of Human Services, uh, school systems, and we come in and help them do what they want to do anyway. And boy, the name of Jesus is getting all kinds of positive work. We made the front page of the Portland Oregonia or yesterday because the people who are serving the homeless with shelters are almost exclusively faith-based, by which you mean Christian organizations. We made the front page of the Oregonian because we're serving the homeless. And, and I take it the, Jesus was there. <laughs> and I take it the Oregonian isn't actually normally viewed as a church uh, propaganda uh, organ. No, it's <laughs> it's more like Portlandia. <laughs> there are actually some some really fine believers that work at at the Oregonian, but their editorial policy is not Christian. I assure you. Yeah, uh, I, I I love to tell a very similar story about a project in West Dallas in which several churches. Uh, banded together to plant a church. This is about 30 years ago, a little more than that now. Uh, plant a church in the poorest area of Dallas, African American community. And in the midst of doing that, uh, they had an African American who wanted to go back to the projects to minister there. But they planted a church. The second thing they did was build a gym. The third thing they did was build a school. And yep. uh, 10 years later, there was an editorial in the Dallas Morning News entitled Angels in Our Midst. Yeah. And uh -huh. it was a testimony to the way in which churches had banded together and actually had 
put together a community project that was actually transforming the community. There were statistics that showed this, and they raised the question, why is it that this can be done privately through the churches, and yet, you know, uh, desegregation was a big issue, and Dallas right. was under desegregation orders longer than any other city in the country, and yet when it comes to dealing with these kinds of issues in our schools, we do so poorly. And the point was is that sometimes churches do this better than anybody else. Yeah. Uh, and same kind of thing in terms of the testimony that exists. So there is this – it builds, as we suggested before, it builds a kind of credibility for the message so that when someone preaches God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life or however you introduce – you're yep. talking about the gospel, there's something there behind it that where people can go, yeah, and I can see it by the way they engage yep. the community. What happens when it becomes the social gospel? is when we're doing those kinds of things and we stop mentioning that we're from Grace Community Church or we stop mentioning the name of Jesus because it might offend somebody. And that's the secularizing temptation that comes with those kinds of things. We find here we don't have that problem at all. We just speak winsomely and with the background of love and care, and people are very welcome to receive us. Yes. Well, uh, I hadn't initially intended to go down quite down this road, but it's a good road to set the stage because I think it raises the question we kind of come back to, is the church a community and is the church a presence? And there's this – Yeah, it is both. And the church as a community functions where God has his people. And it functions where God has his people in such a way, hopefully, that God's presence and grace and truth in in the in the context of living out and the relevance of life is evident uh, to people uh, around them. Fair enough. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, let's talk about big churches here. Um, okay. uh, big churches are supposed to be, in the eyes of some, bad. Uh, they are a way to um, how I say uh, generous to the culture. They are. Um, they are seeker sensitive is sometimes the word you hear attached to to big churches and and the church is supposed to be for the believer. Um, uh, you know, you could probably add to the list uh, beyond the things that I'm the, the music is wrong. Uh, you know, everything about it is a mess. We need to go back to the you know the traditional uh, hymn bearing, uh, uh, Bible loving. Uh, community, uh, internal community, faithful uh, community. Now, of course, I've way overdrawn this uh, so, to to make the point. But uh, your comments: well, How should we think about about uh, the megachurch movement, and and how should we assess the different kinds of megachurches that actually are out there? Well, there are a lot of different kinds of megachurches. And you've got ones that range from multi-campus video venues to large buildings. Uh, you've got people that have teaching teams and charismatic single pastor. You've got people that are very gospel-oriented in, in mega churches. You've got others that are very community-oriented. So there isn't any stereotype that does that covers them. There's a huge variety of large churches and small churches. So, again, to assess them, you have to come back, are they faithful to the gospel? Are they really preaching the word? Are they transforming people's lives? Are they building community of spirit where the people are encouraged to grow and love Lord Jesus Christ even more? Uh, same thing, same criteria for large or small on that. The advantage of a large church, one of the advantages, is that there's, uh, we mentioned your, your daughter is writing curriculum for fifth grade and under, because large churches can do specialized work and hire people that are just really, really super competent area. They can produce curriculum that then the local small church that can't afford to hire a curriculum writer can benefit from those. Because at least large churches I'm around are very free to share their material with other churches that want to uh, 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 use that material. Yeah, and, and it does, and it produces the potential for a variety of experience. Of uh, uh, there's usually a large pool of gifts that are available in a large church, which then impacts the way in which the worship is done and the quality of the worship that it's done, the expertise that's brought to that process. It seems to me that there are uh, some real advantages to the to the size of the church. You know, the people, and I, and I know people who are very uh, theologically astute, who's major complaint about about uh, 
seeker-oriented megachurches and megachurches in general is, is the idea that the church is really the nurturing place for discipleship for believers as opposed to being about evangelism. Their theory is, right. is that evangelism should be taking place throughout the community, in the community outreach, through its members, but the gathering time of the church is a time for believers. What, how, do you, how do you assess that critique of large churches? Well, the, the mission of the church is to do evangelism. Uh, some churches do that through what I call, uh, what's often called the attractional model, the come and see. So you come and you're introduced to the community of the Spirit, you're given the gospel in the morning service, and then the training, the nurture of the believers happens at another time. It may happen on a, an evening service or it may happen in smaller groups. It has to be there, but is the nurture of the church really on the Sunday morning gathering? Uh, most churches I go to, there's not much nurture at all happening on Sunday morning. They have a, a preaching and a song service and a cup of coffee and you go home. There's not much nurture going on there at all. So that what you do on the Sunday morning service can be very evangelistic or very teaching-oriented, but you have to do both. The question is which one goes where. Okay, so when we think about the program of the church, and we're thinking about this theologically in terms of how a church hopefully ideally should be functioning, you really have to look at the whole program of what's happening in the community as opposed to one particular moment or hour. Fair enough? Yep. Well, see, that's what comes back. We define church as a Sunday morning meeting in Mm -hmm. our culture, and biblically that is so incredibly wrong. Church is a 24-7 work of the people of God. So when does nurture happen? Well, sometime during that 24-7. When does evangelism happen? Sometimes during that 24-7, hopefully more than once. But when we define church as the Sunday morning gathering, we have way underdefined the church. And that's that's the ecclesiological attack that I want to make. It's not just Sunday morning. Okay. So, so the question then becomes that your service could be attractional, but your discipleship and your focus on discipleship uh, – b- by the way, uh, it, it's hard to do good discipleship and good teaching in a, in a very large community group in which there are a variety of things going on in the space of an hour. Um, you know, you're worshiping, you're doing your announcements, you're praying as a community, you're, and then you've got your sermon, which, you know, if, if, if the only time the church is teaching is the, is the 30 minutes or so the pastor is speaking, um, that's, that can be a problem. You've, got, you've obviously got your Sunday school, you've got your small groups. There are lots of venues yeah. in a church context in which nurturing can take place. Must happen outside the Sunday morning gathering, because that's all the nurture we get. We're going to be stunted growth for sure. I don't care whether it's large church or small church. And this is why it's very, very important for for people who think about church and who engage with the church to think about the fact that they are part of a community that's designed to function in life, that's your 24-7. as opposed to thinking about, oh, well, the church is a place that I attend, and as long as I'm there one hour a week, I'm, I'm, I'm a good and faithful member. Yeah. Ecclesiologically, you could not be more wrong in defining the church. Well, I guess you could be more wrong, but that's terribly wrong to define the church as your Sunday morning gathering. It's way too limiting in terms of what way it is. Too that you, so, yeah, I grew up on a farm in central Missouri. And our community, I mean, we helped each other out on crops. We did all kinds of things together and then gathered together for Sunday for the specific purpose of singing and praying and preaching as a community. But the life of the church was all all week long. I think we can do the same thing today and should do that today. So uh, I'm almost hearing – now this will be another exaggeration – you could almost throw out the uh, hour-a-week service out of the mix and still be very much the church. I don't want to get rid of that. Either. <laughs> Gathering together is a good thing too. Yeah, right. But if you, yeah, it's got to be. It has to be more than that. Yeah. And so many churches have given up, and it's only the Sunday morning service. And this is large and small, and I think that is just a desperate mistake. 
Okay, so let's let's talk about. Uh, I, want, I still want to stay focused here on the church, these churches of size, because I yep. do think that one of the things that many mega churches do, they're important, and it's important to appreciate it, is the way in which they can impact through community outreach, through the kinds of ministries they have, because of the amount of numbers that they can pour into the effort. That's correct. The sheer numbers of people have an impact and an opportunity for specialization and specialized equipping that is a huge asset to the larger church community. And, uh, and and so in that regard, I think it's important. Another thing that I think is important in the background here that we haven't talked much about is is that we tend to think about the church as individual congregations, whether they're small or large, right. whereas in fact, if we think about this biblically, the church is actually the combination of all those congregations right. as opposed to being one particular community. Right. Uh, One of the emphases we've done here in Portland in the city serve is talk about the church of Quad County. It's actually four different counties in the area, and we band together as a single organization for gatherings for prayer and worship as well as for service, and that's so many different different denominations, and that's maximized, well not maximized, it's really helped our influence in the community, our evangelistic outreach, is because we do have that kind of unity across congregations and donations. Yeah, that's exactly where I'm going, that, that in thinking about individual units and not thinking about how the units have the potential to connect together and right. minister together side by side, particularly in many of the community projects, which, which have demands that usually one congregation can't meet, um, that, that uh, there are real opportunities for, uh, for presenting the presence of the community in the city in a way that a single congregation, almost no matter how large it is, uh, couldn't, couldn't pull off. That's correct. That's correct. And, and so that means that if you're a pastor of a church, um, and I, I do think this is a this is a temptation in in the ministry, is you become so concerned about how your own community is operating and functioning that you can almost become isolated from all the other potential Christian activity that's going on around you, that actually provides uh, other opportunities for your community to grow and mature uh, in, in efforts that might involve more than just your community. Yep. One of the things that I really like is we're out in Gresham, East County here, and we have the prayer fellowship once a month, and pastors and leaders from the various churches come together. We pray together, we do some uh, singing together, and then we just talk what's going on. And the pastors of the churches and the leaders of the churches are friends as well as uh, co-laborers for the cause of Jesus Christ in East County. It's, It's so helpful to have that kind of unity. Yeah, we have two things going on here in Dallas that I can mention that are like that. Uh, Dallas is in the second year of what's been called Movement Day. It's actually something that's come out of Tim Keller's church in New York, and they've decided that the second city that they wanted to uh, push in this direction on was Dallas, and they've had two citywide meetings um, encouraging particularly churches to minister in the community, looking really, really hard in a special way at, at at uh, cross ethnic ministry, if I can describe it that way, um, and, and making churches aware of needs in other parts of the city, and, and and bringing people together. That's one thing that's happening. That's that's along those lines. And a second thing that happens is there is a there is a very uh, good tight personal network between many pastors of the leading large churches in the city, uh, that and they meet together uh, once a month. Uh, to interact, pray together, uh, let each other know what's going on in their communities, uh, think about ways in which they can work together, that kind of thing. Um, very, very healthy ministers group in the old sense of the term, uh, yep. but cross-denominational and, uh, and really very, very uh, effective. When we were introducing the table, for example, uh, just getting launched, that they invited me out to speak with them. And so, you know, immediately all the pastors of many of the major churches in Dallas knew what we were doing. Right. Um, and and could get and could even give me feedback, which was terrific in terms of what was going on, in terms of what would be helpful to them and that kind of thing. Thus, we're doing a topic like this, and mm-hmm. uh, 
And, and I think that the potential there is huge in terms of, uh, of what can come out of that kind of cross-community ministry. Right. And that's where large churches can resource smaller churches and form that community of, of churches together that's so helpful. And the, the piece that I like there is when large churches see smaller churches as partners – in the ministry that they can help out with the unique things that they can do, but they can also appreciate that small churches can do things that a large church can't do. So again, there's that partnership of different ways of doing things. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Join us next week for part two. Dallas Theological Seminary, teach truth, love well.